All right, good evening, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started tonight. Um, welcome to our living room lecture series, and thank you for joining us. We have a human and ecological history of California's Northern Channel Islands by Todd Bragey. My name is Stephanie Sandoval, and I'm the deputy director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. Just a few announcements before we get started. Next Saturday, September 10th, we will be at the Escondido Great Day Festival. It's an all day community event, so feel free to come and check out our booth. Also that same day, we have a couple of past lectures screening um, at the center in our classroom. These happen every second Saturday and up, month, um, up this month are talks on late Pleistocene turkeys and archeological research in Togo. No reservations are necessary, so hopefully you can join us for those. Our next living room lecture is on October 6th. Betsy Payne will present her research on El Cuervo, an adobe in the Penasquitos area of San Diego. Details on this and other information about the center, our curation efforts and programs can be found online at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Um, as always tonight, we will be using the Q&A feature so you can find that on your Zoom control panel. Feel free to enter your questions at any time throughout the presentation and then they will be answered during a moderated Q&A at the end. I'm very pleased to introduce Todd Bragey. He is a professor and department chair of anthropology at San Diego State University. Todd conducts research on the archeology span and historical ecology of maritime hunter-gatherer fishers and maritime migrations. His latest book um, is Islands Through Time, A Human and Ecological History of the Northern Channel Islands. Sorry, it's kind of going in and out here. Um, for those who um, received this book as part of their donation for their talk, you should have you may have received it already. If you haven't, the next batch is going in the mail tomorrow morning, so you should get that sh shortly. We have a few copies left, so if you're interested, you can contact me about how to make a purchase. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, I want to say before I get started, uh, a big thank you to Stephanie and the center. They put this all together and I really appreciate it. So Stephanie and, and Dante and all your work, uh, really much appreciated. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about um, um, my latest book, this Islands Through Time book. And it's sort of, um, sort of what uh, I and a couple of my colleagues, uh, John Erlinson and Torben Rick, who are co-authors on this book, sort of our journey to understand the ecological and human history of the Northern Islands. Uh, for me over the last 20 years or so, and for, for John and Tori, uh, much longer than that. So John, 40 years or so, and, and Tori somewhere in between. So uh, this is sort of our, our, uh, uh, our attempt to bring it all together in a, a readable format. Um, but it's also hinges on our collaborations and cooperation and, and uh, work with Chumash communities in Southern California. So I wanna thank them and uh, the research by dozens and dozens of people who are cited in the book, who we talk about their research um, and have contributed to, to various parts of the book. So. Uh, this is not just us, it's a lot of people and a lot of time and effort and just incredible work um, that has been done on the islands. And this is kind of our celebration of that. So what I wanna to do today is kind of take you through some of that history. And then I wanna end with why I think it's so important to study this history and some of the lessons we can learn uh, in terms of modern management of the Channel Islands and marine and terrestrial ecosystems around the world. Let me see. All right, so um, when uh, the Spanish arrived in, in Southern California, the Shumash were the historic occupants of the, the Northern Islands, Northern Channel Islands you see here, and then the, the California coastal and inland mainland. Uh, they lived in these uh, socio-politically complex, large villages that sort of dotted the coast uh, along the islands and the mainland and stretched into interior regions along the mainland coast, reaching some of the densest populations of hunter-gatherers ever recorded um, uh, 
uh, in North America and around the globe. So just a, a really fascinated story. And, and what I think that we need to appreciate, or one of the things that I always think about, is the legacy that was left by this millennia-long sort of occupation and interaction with these island environments that have really shaped the islands that we know today. And these records in the stewardship of the, of the Shumash can really tell us a lot about how we move forward in terms of uh, restoration biology, managing these islands and thinking about what and, and, and how they should look uh, today and, and moving into the future. So the islands themselves have undergone tremendous changes uh, since the first uh, Shumash ancestors uh, uh, showed up on their shores. So here are the Northern Channel Islands today and Anacapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and to the far to the west of the channel, San Miguel Island, uh, making up the four Northern Channel Islands. Uh, 20,000 years ago, 18,000 years ago, these islands looked very different. They were coalesced into a single island that we call Santa Rosa today. So you could walk from Anacapa all the way past and beyond uh, San Miguel Island, but you couldn't walk from the mainland to the island. So these islands in the, in the Quaternary were not connected to the mainland. So you had to be in a boat. You had to make an ocean crossing uh, to get to the islands. And it was through time that these islands, uh, sea levels rose and these islands gradually took the, the shape that we know today. So the first or earliest uh, site that we have recorded on the islands was excavated in 1959 uh, by Phil Orr, who was the um, director of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And it was at a very famous spot, a famous site, the Arlington Spring site on Santa Rosa Island. Uh, it's now been dated to 13,000 years ago. So this is the canyon that, that uh, Arlington Springs was found in, and, and this is John Johnson, who uh, up until recently was uh, the uh, was an archaeologist at the Santa Barbara Museum, natural history and curator. Um, he uh, working with Chumash communities to date sediments um, and date human remains. These Arlington Springs remains, Arlington Springs man, again dated to 13,000 years. So we know people were out there, uh, the ancestors of the Shumash were out there very early, and there was continuous occupation through the terminal Pleistocene, um, all the way up, you know, terminal Pleistocene being this, this ice age period, all the way up to historic contact and beyond. And besides Arlington Springs, which are essentially a set of human remains, uh, we knew very little until recently about these early occupants. This is Daisy Cave, another very famous site on the Channel Islands. This is one of the places that we have, we have gotten a little bit more information or quite a bit more information on some of these earliest island occupants. So uh, these were our uh, a set of technologies that date to some of the earliest levels at Daisy Cave that go back to 11,700 years ago. And from these, we have things like shell beads where people were making um, shell bead ornamentation for necklaces or to decorate clothing. These are some of the earliest fish hooks in all of North America. These are uh, bone by points called fish gorges and they, they were used to catch near near shore kelp forest fish. These are probably sandal fragments, uh, well preserved in this cave environment. And these likely trimmings from the maintenance of fishing nets. And then some chipstone tools like these what are called crescents, probably used in bird hunting or other sort of small game hunting like aquatic animals. So what we know about the Shumash is that they were throughout their history maritime hunter and gatherers. And uh, even the earliest occupants were doing this sort of generalized maritime hunting and gathering. They were hunting probably for aquatic birds and saw, small mammals. They were doing fishing and then gathering a variety of nearshore shellfish as well. 
as the primary protein base of their diet. So for many years, this is uh, sort of uh, the uh, Daisy Cave uh, was the sort of quintessential terminal Pleistocene, early Holocene, very old sites uh, on the islands that told us most of what we knew about the life ways of these early occupants. So over the last 10 years, um, we've been able, and this has sort of been spearheaded by John Erlinson and, and Torben Rick and, and others, uh, have been able to discover a, a variety of new uh, archeological sites that date back to 11,000 years and beyond. And part of the reason for that is the recognition that some of uh, other, some other classes of stone tools are very early markers of human occupation on the Channel Islands. These are called G Channel Island bar points or other varieties called mole points, but these are stemmed point varieties. They're very small, as you can see, very delicate, very expertly flaked, probably used as uh, uh, for hunting small aquatic game like sea otters or other small sea mammals, uh, maybe as uh, uh, the tips to fishing spears. And then also these crescents that show up on the mainland, but also show up on the islands that you saw with Daisy Cave. And from a variety of sites, this one right near Arlington Springs uh, on Santa Rosa Island along the coast, Tori and John, and, and, and colleagues have worked at these sites and shown uh, that these sort of hunting technologies, maritime foraging and hunting economies, and a variety of, of game that were being pursued. Things like uh, goose and seabird and fish bones, marine mammal bones, including uh, elephant seal bones, and a now extinct uh, uh, flightless scoter. Uh, flightless duck, uh, if you will, uh, found in the remains. So this, this really sophisticated um, and generalized maritime hunting and gathering economy. So once we recognized these technologies as markers of, of the early Holocene and terminal Pleistocene, in the last decade or so, we've been able to find more and more sites across the island. So to date, these numbers and, and this data is probably um, a bit dated already because we continue to, to find more and more sites. But right now, uh, we have somewhere around 20 sites that are radiocarbon dated to more than 9,500 years, four sites radiocarbon dated to more than 12,000 years, and 70 plus other sites dating to the terminal Pleistocene or early Holocene based on this diagnostic technology. Now, this is, a, this is uh, amazing and something that, that sort of shocked us when we started to find this record, this extensive early Holocene and terminal Pleistocene record, because you have to remember that at the time that these sites were being occupied, uh, the islands looked very different than they did today. So 75% of San Jose has been lost by rising post-glacial seas since the last glacial maximum 18,000 years ago. So these sites, and you can kind of see them in red, they're not all of them, but they're, they're many of the earliest ones, are inland sites when they were occupied, right? They're not right on the coastline. So these maritime hunter and foragers, we can only assume had a, a number of other sites that we have no resolution on, no visibility, because they're now uh, below the waves, they're underwater. And there's work by Amy Gusick. I've been involved in, in some of this and John as well and others who are starting to look under the waves, under sea, on the seafloor for some of these early sites that have been inundated by post-glacial uh, post, uh, sea level rise. And so what we have, one of the things that makes the islands so special for me and for many other archeologists and really world famous is this extensive record of very early human um, occupation and uh, coastal adaptations uh, in the new world. One of the, the, the places that has uh, one of the densest and most extensive record of early sites in anywhere uh, in North and South America. 
uh, and really just makes it a really special place to work. Uh, it's also contributed to major questions uh, that still are uh, front and center in archaeology today, and that is when and how did people first arrive to North and South America? Who were the first Americans? And it may be uh, that that question is remains unanswered, but it may be that these stemmed technologies, these Channel Island barbed points or mole points, may be a marker of early human migration along coastlines uh, around the Northeast Pacific into the New World, into North and South America. So they're not the oldest sites uh, in North in South America by, uh, by a long shot, but they do tell us that people were traveling and subsisting along coastlines very early. John Erlinson is, is famously talked about the kelp highway hypothesis, that it may be these coastal resources, kelp forest resources that help facilitate very early migrations into North and South America. So from that sort of famous, uh, sort of well-known history or, or celebrated history of very early occupation of the, the Northern Islands, of the Channel Islands, um, what happened next, right? One of the big questions that we take on in this book is how do we go from these fairly small groups of maritime, highly mobile maritime hunter-gatherers to these very socio-politically complex Shumash uh, communities starting 1,500 years ago all the way up to historic contact uh, on the mainland and uh, mainland coast in, in Northern Channel Islands. Certainly they remain hunter and gatherers, but how do we get these large villages taking shape, socio-political complexity arising? What happens to go from that 13,000 or more year history up to the, all these socio-political changes uh, through time? One of the great things about the islands and one of the reasons that it, it, it's such a special place to work is that we have these really well-preserved records that go back millennia. So this is one of my favorite sites on all the islands. This is on Northwest San Miguel Island. This is a huge dune complex that has shellmans, basically uh, the debris of people living in this area and depositing their refuse from meals, from producing tools, from creating technologies, uh, all their activities sort of written into this landscape. And so we have 7,000 years of human and ecological history that we can learn from. And just to give you some scale, there's two folks standing at the top of this dune complex. And all these kind of dark lines are really dense, uh, shellmans, trash piles, if you will, right? They're more than trash, or they're much more than trash, but records of, of, of human, humans living in this area, the Shumash and their ancestors living in this area, that we can then go study and learn about this really deep uh, human ecological history. And so this time in between is uh, it, it, this time from about the early Holocene, right, about 8,000 years ago up to, a, a, we usually set it at about around 3,000, 3,500 years ago is called the middle Holocene, right? And this has often been called the muddle in the middle, right? That uh, an area that for the most part, lots of archaeologists have been really interested in the early stuff. And then the stuff late in time when we get social political complexity. And this muddle in the middle then, this middle Holocene is, has been uh, comparatively um, less intensively studied. Now, Mike Glassow is a retired archeologist at, at Santa Barbara, still active, doing a lot of great work, has uh, uh, championed uh, the importance of the middle Holocene. And, and I couldn't agree more. This is a really interesting time in uh, Chumash history and island history where we see a lot of changes taking place that set up that sets up what happens or what the Spanish find or, 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 or write about when they arrive. And one of the things that we see is an expansion in economies, people going after new kinds of environments like more intensively terrestrial resources. Uh, these um, blue dicks, these geophytes that are 
um, sort of starch that have starchy bulbs that people were eating. Things like estuaries. We have the only known estuary on eastern Santa Rosa Island and people going after estuarine clams and then expanding their, their uh, subsistence systems to new classes like uh, new classes of resources or becoming more reliant uh, on a variety of, of, of local resources to deal with rising populations and stresses on local environments that that must have placed. And so what we see during this time is uh, early economies were often focused on shellfish harvesting, the easiest to gather intertidal shellfish species uh, that were reliable, uh, could produce a lot of calories, a lot of um, uh, resources, and were very readily available. So those, in turn, they continue to be a really important part of the diet, but in relative importance, they start to uh, play less of a role as new sort of more, what we call intensive resources, resources that uh, require more technology, that require more labor, uh, that are less uh, predictable become part of the system. So a rise in things like sea mammal hunting and fin fishing and bird hunting start to become more important through this sort of middle Holocene or from the early Holocene to the late Holocene. So we get things like, uh, these are very famous red abalone middens. These are red abalone or a subtital mollusk species that um, are uh, or were readily available uh, along the, the Northern Islands, especially uh, on the far Western end of the channel that tell us about people going uh, into deeper waters to dive, perhaps doing boat-based harvesting, again, as sort of as part of this diversification of economies. We see changing technologies through this through time as people expand these uh, technologies. Things like mortars and pestles uh, start to show up in, in sites uh, more abundantly or more regularly. These uh, examples here to process things like plant foods, most likely. Think new technology to go after these thin fish that become a greater part of the, the subsistence economy. So here are these circular shell fish hooks that first appear about 3,400 years ago, again, associated with this intensification of a maritime fishing economy through time. Again, all presumably to uh, uh, born out of a need to uh, sustain larger populations and to sustain populations that are becoming more uh, circumscribed in their environment. They're less able to move around uh, regularly as resources are depleted from one area because the islands are becoming infilled uh, with people, with communities, and you start to bump into your neighbors. We also see people at this time uh, starting to maintain plant communities uh, across terrestrial landscapes. So Christina Gill, um, uh, Christina Hoppe, uh, and, and others have, have written and done a lot of research to show that uh, Chumash communities, like they were doing on the mainland, probably started burning uh, a controlled burning uh, the uh, landscapes of the Northern Channel Islands to create uh, communities or, or create landscapes that were highly productive for these geophytes, for blue dicks. And you can kind of see a sea of them here that do really well in recently burned areas and disturbed soils. And this became a more important and a growing part of uh, their subsistence economy and would have been essential. A carbohydrate like that would have been essential to balance out their, their diet. So for at least that 7,000 years, we have this regular landscape burning on the islands uh, to create these um, the, the landscapes that, that, that suited their subsistence activities and intensification of subsistence activities on the islands. And at the same time during the Middle Holocene, we see people for the first time start to settle down. So uh, people settling down and staying longer 
or staying year round in large villages. So this is work by Chester King from 1990. Lynn Gamble has done a lot of work. She's worked at, uh, this is uh, a site on Western Santa Cruz Island uh, that, that Dr. Gamble at, at UCSB Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara has done a lot of work at, um, who've uh, demonstrated uh, uh, permanent occupation, intensive harvesting in this local area, and the beginnings of social and wealth differences between individuals. And, and, and how do we see that? Well, Chester King showed that some individuals were, were buried with a greater diversity and density of highly prized items or sort of wealth items like shell beads and ornaments. This is the seeds of social political hierarchies that were in place for at least 6,000 years. So again, sort of the antecedents of uh, the rise of complexity on the islands that, uh, that show these tremendous changes during the Middle Holocene. We also have landscape changes. Not only are people burning, but people are doing a lot of uh, other uh, activities that are fundamentally changing these ecosystems. So Torben Rick, this is a picture of him, one of uh, my co-authors. He's done a lot of work on species introductions and extinctions during this middle Holocene, early Holocene period. And his work, along with work by one of his former postdocs, who's now at, at Oklahoma, Courtney Hoffman, uh, using radiocarbon dating, uh, traditional archaeology, and genetic studies of uh, archaeological, historical, and modern foxes, they've demonstrated that the island fox that we know today, this cute house-sized cat um, a uh, fox that, that is uh, a, uh, a unique species on the Channel Islands uh, probably was introduced by the Shumash uh, 9,000 years ago. So the introduction of mainland gray foxes that uh, by the Shumash, those animals or the, you know, that group evolved into the island foxes that we know today. So rather than sort of a natural colonization by mainland gray foxes, all the data is sort of pointing towards this was a deliberate introduction by people uh, at least 9,000 years ago. We know people were introducing the Shumash and their ancestors were introducing other creatures as well. These are um, deer mice, mainland deer mice were introduced probably around 11,000 years ago. Likely this was by accident, right? Stowaways on canoes that were um, uh, that were uh, being uh, paddled out from the mainland to the islands. Uh, but these uh, deer mice uh, outcompeted and interacted with uh, giant island deer, deer mice that, that then went extinct after this millennia long process of re replacement out uh, out competing uh, the the native giant island deer mice uh, on the on the northern islands. Uh, there's always been questions. You, you you probably all have heard about uh, pygmy mammoths and you know these unique dwarf mammoths that we find out on the Channel Islands, uh, the northern islands. Uh, there were also uh, full sized mammoths out on the islands that would swim out uh, on the islands as well. The evidence that we have is inconclusive in terms of the roles of people and the extinction of mammoths out on the islands and, and uh, pygmy mammoths, dwarf mammoths. Uh, the last mammoth that we have going extinct is around 13,000 years ago. And the, Shumash, the ancestors of the Shumash show up uh, the earliest archaeological site, again, is at Arlington Spring sites that dates to about 13,000 years ago. So there's never been any, uh, you know, uh, direct evidence of human hunting of these animals, but there is this uh, very close occurrence between the disappearance of these animals and the arrival of humans. But what we do know is that humans certainly contributed to the extinction of Chendiades, this extinct flightless scoter that I mentioned earlier that we have in some of these earliest, the remains of which we have in some of the earliest island sites. 
but this was a protracted extinction. And um, uh, Terry Jones at uh, Cal Poly has is, is, uh, led much of this work, but showing both on the mainland and the islands, these uh, flightless scoters go extinct about 2,400 years ago. And so humans were interacting and hunting uh, and overlapping with these animals for millennia before they finally went extinct. But that's besides these two, these, this is the only uh, examples of extinction that we have on the islands that may be tied to humans. So uh, starting about 1500 years ago is when we really see uh, take shape the characteristics that were identified by the Spanish uh, at historic contact among the Chumash communities. So starting about 1500 years ago, we see across the Channel Islands and the mainland, the consolidation of villages. So if, if in this picture, you can kind of see these indentations, these circular indentations. Uh, these are semi-subterranean uh, house pits, uh, places where people were living that would have had a shelter over them. And uh, around these house pits are the remain, the refuse remains of people living in this area for, uh, for uh, hundreds of years, right? And so these large consolidated villages with carefully laid out uh, things like cemeteries, uh, sweat lodges, dance floors, and other sort of uh, identifiers that we, that we can read about from the historical records really start to take shape across the Santa Barbara Channel. We also have the appearance, or what seems to be the appearance for the first time, of the iconic tamal, the redwood sewn plank canoe that uh, very famously was the hub of transportation that moved people and products from the mainland to the islands uh, regularly, every day as part of a trading and transport uh, and interaction sphere that moved from the northern to the southern islands and from the islands to the mainland. And uh, a, also at, at this time, we start to see a even more elevated reliance on fishing. So again, it's sort of doubling down on uh, kelp forest and near shore fishing as these populations ramp up and, and uh, resources are stressed and these villages have very specific sort of foraging uh, areas. And so you have to extract more resources out of a smaller area to feed more people. And how do you do that? Well, you intensify your economies to include more and more fishing that, cre that creates the need for better and, and, and more boating technology for more uh, fishing and more efficient fishing tackle. And at the same time, we see the increased production of exchange items to, uh, for trade and exchange across the islands and from the islands to the mainland. So when we look at sort of uh, overall, we, we can see this very strongly, right? This, this decline in shellfish as the primary protein uh, of island hunter-gatherers to a, an economy largely based on thin fishing. Again, part of this intensification process. And uh, not only that, we see uh, uh, changes in uh, the standardized economy on the Channel Islands. So we start to see people uh, having very specific roles uh, and standardized roles uh, across Shumash, um, uh, Shumash communities. So we uh, shell beads, which had been produced. Again, I showed you some from, from Daisy Cave from these olive snail shells. Uh, the earliest of which were just ground on the top and then strung on necklaces or clothing. By the time we get to the late Holocene, uh, a shell bead, a money bead, was made out of one of these olivella snail shells. It was a very specific part of the shell, could only be used to make a money bead. They were chipped out, 
and then they were ground down and perforated and, and, and perfected and then put on string. And these became the money that you have in your pockets, right? So this became standardized currency along the Santa Barbara channel. And we find these beads traded uh, across the American West, right? So this became standardized currency uh, that regulated trade and uh, exchange uh, across the Santa Barbara Channel and beyond. So this, that, and the mint where most, the vast, vast majority of these beads were made were the Northern Channel Islands. It was the mint. It was uh, Washington DC or the, the, uh, the, the mint of, of shell money beads. We also see uh, specialized roles, like most famously, uh, the Brotherhood of the Tamal, who were a subsection of Shumash society who, can, who uh, controlled the knowledge on how to construct tamals, these sewn plank redwood canoes that were the mechanism of trade, right? So all of this becomes standardized and, uh, 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 and, and part of the fabric of, of Chumash society. So this really all ramps up at a time when things uh, seem to be very difficult, right? So right around 1500 years ago to about 1200 years ago, or a little later than that, actually. But um, during this period, what we see is uh, things like uh, evidence of increased interpersonal violence, evidence that uh, people are having violent interactions with one another. So this is this is sort of a really basic chart showing through time uh, what we have of evidence of lethal um, interpersonal violence among communities on the on the northern islands. So there are, are these conflicts, and one of the reasons there there seems to be this conflict, and and this has been worked by Doug Kennett, who's at, at UC Santa Barbara as well, uh, and others, Gene Arnold and, and, and many others, uh, what, what it seems is this was a time where uh, people were coalescing in villages and, and, this, and this intensification was ramping up because uh, we have uh, a dry and unstable period between about 1300 to 500 years ago where uh, people are coalescing on the Channel Islands around fresh water in these large villages because water becomes a premium. They, if you've been out to the islands, you know they're fairly dry and it, this uh, was exacerbated during this time. But also at the same time, water temperatures were on average cooler and suggesting that there were uh, more marine resources like thin fish available. So it was a good time to, to go after these marine resources, but a very difficult time in terms of fresh water and some of the challenges and uh, the, that that presented for the Shumash. So potentially you have these sort of uh, 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 violence and, and sort of sociopolitical changes that are at least partly a result of these changing environmental conditions. And so from that, we have the rise of things uh, of, of Shumash hierarchies, where uh, we have uh, circumscribed leadership. We have the rise of chiefs that help deal with uh, these conflicts and manage these villages and help uh, structure this, this tr these trade economies and this, this ramp up of this sort of very um, complex socio-political uh, relationships and economies across the Santa Barbara Channel. Well, of course, this all changed um, uh, when the Spanish arrived uh, with uh, the, the arrival of, of Cabrillo um, in 1542, who wintered uh, probably somewhere on the Northern Islands for six weeks. This ushered in a new era for uh, Southern California and one that was devastating for traditional Shumash economies and indigenous populations throughout the American West. And so what we see from the arrival of, 
of Spanish and, and um, uh, explorers and, and settlers is the introduction of things like diseases that rapidly spread through the Santa Barbara Channel region, devastated populations. Um, and uh, as, as the story is throughout North and South America uh, with the post-Columbian world, the spread of uh, old world diseases that indigenous populations had little to no uh, immunity or, or um, exposure to that, that wiped out um, uh, that wiped out entire communities and was was devastating for these traditional economies. So one of the things that that happens in Southern California is um, we, we have in the past um, perhaps uh, we we've gotten better in understanding this period of of the California Mission period, uh, but it's part of uh, or has been part of of what we've celebrated in terms of the history of Southern California and what's been called the Ramona myth, this idea that uh, Spanish arrival and uh, this cultural contact that was happening during this period was one of sharing and learning and uh, change that, that uh, was one to be celebrated in Southern California. But of course, the reality was, was very different to this. In, in the Santa Barbara Channel region, uh, in particular, uh, Chumash were um, uh, suffered greatly during this time, not only in populations declines because of diseases, but uh, being forced to build uh, here, making adobe bricks, build the infrastructure of Spanish colonization of Southern and Central California, the Presidios and missions, and just in many, many cases, inhumane treatment uh, and the rooting out, the intentional rooting out of uh, indigenous lifeways in Southern California, which, um, uh, which again was sort of devastating this millennia long history of, of uh, occupation, of, of um, interaction with Southern California ecosystems. And, you know, uh, to some degree, while, while uh, the Chumash uh, persisted and they continued uh, many of their traditions and in the face of devastating change, uh, in many cases, you need to understand that uh, there, there was, uh, they didn't have a lot of options. And one of the reasons that, that the Chumash in particular and many groups in, in uh, Southern California, indigenous groups in Southern California, didn't have many options is because their traditional economies, these hunter-gatherer lifeways that we had in the Santa Barbara Channel region and throughout California were fundamentally changed by the introduction of agrarian and pastoral systems that were introduced by the Spanish. So things like the introduction of non-native species like cattle, um, domesticated cattle into California fundamentally changed landscapes and ecosystems and made it impossible to continue traditional um, subsistence activities for the Chumash and for other indigenous communities. So uh, while there was resistance, uh, and there are many great stories of that and ways in which uh, the Chumash and other indigenous groups persisted through this time, uh, there were many factors that sort of uh, made this resistance very, very difficult. Fortunately, in Southern California, in the Santa Barbara region, uh, throughout California, we have many cases here with, with the Chumash um, of a, uh, uh, a, uh, a continued uh, uh, Native American traditions, a revitalization of Native American and celebration of, of this long history of, of Native American uh, indigenous communities in Southern California. The Chumash are still here. They're still in the Santa Barbara Channel region. Uh, they're continuing uh, their uh, continuing traditional um, uh, practices. We have much to learn from them. 
uh, and, and, and from these traditions. Um, and they're still, these communities continue to persist. And it's things like this. This is the, the, the celebration for this fountain that, that uh, represents uh, an important Chumash, part of an important Chumash creation story. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the, the celebration of this, this fountain, sort of uh, uh, celebrating the history of the Chumash uh, in Santa Barbara. So I, I, I'll sort of end with some examples of why we need to continue to study this history and why it's so important that we continue have to have uh, indigenous communities, the Chumash in particular, um, and the incredible records they left behind teach us about how the islands look, why they look like they do today, and, and how we want them to look in the future. So we know that uh, the Chumash, for example, well, uh, introduced a variety of, of animals to the islands, including dogs, uh, foxes, deer mice. Uh, Torben Rick and others are, are doing some work on potentially the Chumash may have introduced skunks. There's a uh, endemic, or there's, there's a, uh, uh, a Santa, uh, the Channel Island skunk out on the Northern Islands. Um, and it may be uh, that, that skunks were intentionally like these other animals like dogs and foxes intentionally brought out to the islands. And so these sort of introductions by the Chumash that date back millennia in the case of foxes 9,000 years ago, in the case of dogs at least 7,000 years ago, must have changed these islands uh, in considerable ways. When I think about the islands uh, before the introduction of these animals, before the Chumash arrived, uh, the islands might have looked something like this, right? This kind of bird paradise. And while we have this diversity of marine bird species out on the islands today, that um, they must have looked very different before these new predators were introduced. And so what does that mean for our management on the islands? We also can learn from the Chumash uh, a different way to, um, to, uh, a, to harvest local resources. So the tradition you'll notice and what we went over for the Chumash was that as populate, the, the earliest peoples to arrive to the islands uh, focus their economy on low trophic level uh, species, things like shellfish, right? That um, are readily available, abundant and fast growing on the island and sort of occupy lower rungs of the, of the, uh, the trophic scale. Right as populations increased, they fished up the food web, and so started to add in higher trophic level species. And so this accelerated or went part and parcel with the development of new technologies, things like new fishing tackle, harpoons, and circular shell fish hooks to make this intensification possible. So going after a diverse diet. And then uh, as populations increase, as intensification uh, ramps up, going after higher trophic level species through time. We do the exact opposite in our uh, harvesting of the oceans today and, and uh, how we interact or, or go after marine resources. We tend to go after the highest trophic level species first. When they're gone, we fish down the food web. Very made very famous by uh, Daniel Pauly, an ecologist out of uh, BC. But think about what you eat or uh, tend to eat at sushi restaurants. It's the tunas, it's the mackerels, it's the uh, the high trophic level species, and uh, that's what's most expensive or most desirable. And then we fish down the food web. So a more sustainable way may be one that at least is partially modeled on Chumash strategies to, to harvest resources. We also, from these archeological sites, can get a better idea of how to manage species themselves. So we've done a lot of work uh, looking at the sizes of various important 
uh, sport and commercial fishes in Southern California today. So things like rockfish and found that in the past, despite the fact that uh, people were probably fishing in near shore environments, were using hook and line technology and, 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 and netting, near shore netting technology, they were still going after rock fishes that were significantly larger than we do today in sport and commercial fisheries. So this can go a long way in helping us try to understand what does a healthy marine environment look like? What do healthy rockfish populations look like? Can and how can we use uh, the records, archaeological records on places like the Channel Islands to help us set things like size limits, bag limits, and uh, targets for restoration of these species that are now things like rockfish and these other species uh, becoming dangerously overfished. We've done some similar work uh, for uh, California sheephead that are a really interesting fish, but again, using bones from archaeological sites to get sizes of these uh, fish that were uh, caught in the past and comparing those to sizes today and finding significant differences, much larger in the past than they are today. And how can we use that information to develop better management strategies uh, today? We also, um, and I, I do a long sort of thing about this in the book, but um, we've also found some really interesting findings about uh, how we conceptualize the recovery and management of things like sea mammals in Southern California. So to really give you the Cliff Notes version, today you go to the Channel Islands or Southern California, and on many, many beaches, you'll see elephant seals, right? These big lumbering, uh, animals, the males with these huge noses fighting and, and, and blubbering around. You find lots and lots of these creatures in Southern and Central California. Uh, you rarely see Guadalupe fur seals. They're generally restricted uh, to uh, Guadalupe Island and sort of uh, Baja, Mexico, right? So the archeological record tells us this was the, the complete opposite was true. These are archaeological sites in Southern California with Northern elephant seal bones that have been recovered. These are sites in Central and Southern California with Gua Guadalupe fur seal bones recovered. A lot of this work was, was uh, uh, really uh, led by Torben Rick. And again, there's been this, this reversal in the biogeographic distribution of these animals. So both of these species have recovered from near extinction during the historical fur trade. They have made dramatic recoveries. Both of them have. Uh, elephant seals to the tune of hundreds of thousands are now around. Uh, Guadalupe fur seals, about 20,000, 30,000 animals are now uh, in Southern California, Baja area. Um, but the archaeological record suggests that these environments may have looked very different or the biogeography of these animals look very different. So our management should, isn't done. Uh, something has changed and there's much more work to do to understand these changes. Just because we wall off nature, right? And, one, and, and, and give these animals time to recover or nature time to recover, doesn't mean it goes back to what it was in the past. Uh, it's much more complicated than that. And so there's much to learn from the archaeological record. We know in terms of the islands in particular, the islands in Southern California and really all of uh, our ecosystems in North and South America were fundamentally changed uh, in the post-Columbian world with the rise of ranching and farming and commercialized fishing and sealing and whaling and all these other commercial industries. On the islands themselves, uh, it wasn't long ago where they were filled with cattle uh, and pigs and other introduced domestic animals that have fundamentally changed these landscapes. And so it's going to be archeological records that can help us think about how we want them to look today. What do we mean by natural? 
Um, how do we conceptualize that? And, and how do we put the islands back to something that's more sustainable and that looked uh, more, uh, looked more like a natural world before all these changes were wrought onto the uh, uh, terrestrial marine ecosystems. So just like uh, we, we have with, with, um, with animals, I think there's a lot of work that, that could be done, uh, that needs to be done to think about, well, what did the island terrestrial environments look like in the deep past when the Shumash were there in these thriving villages. We know where they were burning the islands. What plants might have they introduced just like they introduced animals? Are there plants that they introduced as well? And what did these landscapes look like through time? And what does that tell us about fixing the damage or how we repair these terrestrial um, landscapes? from the introduced grasses and introduced um, ungulates, these introduced uh, domesticated animals that have fundamentally changed these terrestrial ecosystems during the ranching period. So there's, there's no one right answer for this, right? This is a little schematic that, that Torben Rick and, and John and uh, many others were part of a paper that we, we came up with. But um, conservation and management today uh, one of the things that, that I talk to my students about a lot, one of the things that is the focus of this book is that we need the past. The past is our roadmap for helping us understand what the present and future of land and seascape should look like. And without the past, without archaeological records and paleontological records and traditional ecological knowledge that comes from indigenous communities like the Shumash, we have no roadmap to understand uh, what these places should look like and how to restore them to more sustainable and resilient systems. And so it's gonna continue to be historical sciences, work with indigenous communities that is gonna lead us to a more sustainable world. And I really do believe that archeology span has a, an important role to play here on the Channel Islands and around the world. All right, that's all I have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Todd. My name is Dante Ferenga and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archeological Center. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion. As usual, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom control panel, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Is there any evidence of differential site preservation over time at the interior island sites? Oops. Um, so, uh, you know, um, yes, right? So one of the great things about the Channel Islands is that uh, they don't have the much hated burrowing animals like gophers that are much maligned by archeologists that work in mainland environments. And because what they do and what they do particularly in Southern California is they burrow down through archeological sites, they churn things up. And so uh, they can mix up time periods and, and, and uh, uh, bio, what we call bioturbate archeological sites. Since we don't have those, and we have these islands that have been largely protected by a variety of agencies like the US Navy, the Nature Conservancy, Channel Islands National Park. We have these great records of, uh, that, that extend deep back in time. And they're often like a layer cake, right? We could go to, to sites that have you know, a thousand year old occupation, then a 5,000, then a 7,000, then maybe a 10,000 year old occupation, right? Just incredible preservation. Those, because these are maritime hunter gatherers and they were, were focused on, at least for the protein economies on the coast, many of these big sites um, are found on the coast. We do have inland sites. They tend to be smaller and they tend to be part of a, uh, what we would call logistical campsites, right? You move inland to do things like go after terrestrial resources like these blue dick bulbs and harvest those. Uh, we do find shellmans, you know, people eating meals, but those had to have been 
hauled in from the coast. And if you get too far inland, you might think to, you, you might decide to shuck the shell and throw away the stuff you're not going to eat because it's heavy to bring that inland. So you might not have that represented in an archaeological site. So there are these issues in terms of preservation, whether they're main, whether they're on the coast or they're inland, they're they very well preserved compared to the mainland, but we still have problems. Shrink and sw swell soils uh, that that um, uh, mess up sites. Some we do have some animals that do some burrowing in sites, and then of course, and then of course along the coast, wave action and and um, uh, weathering and, and you know storms and uh, really devastate archaeological sites. And, and many of these sites are eroding into the ocean. So I hope I answered that kind of yes and no, I guess. And are changes in the maritime uh, subsistence patterns evidenced over time in the island sites, are those mirrored in mainland coastal sites? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, they are mirrored. There's some differences on the mainland. And, you know, primarily that's due to the fact that there's just a lot more resource. If you go to Santa Barbara, um, there's a lot more mainland resources, right? But the largest uh, animal that you could hunt on the Channel Islands, the Northern Islands, after mammoths went extinct, were these uh, island foxes, right? These small island foxes. On the mainland, you have deer and elk and rabbits and all these other resources that you can go after. And the Santa Barbara Channel mainland, in general, has what, what has been called these stacked resources, right? If, you, if you've been in Santa Barbara, you could be down the coast or up in the mountains very, very quickly. And so there are all these different habitats. And one of the most important ones, not only for these terrestrial animals, but uh, acorn resources, mast resources that were harvested uh, starting at least six to 7,000 years, well, re really back to, to 10,000 years on the mainland that weren't available to, to that abundance on the islands. You don't have these mast resources on the islands. Can you tell us how archaeologists detect interpersonal violence during the rise of complexity? Yeah, so that's that's a great question um, and uh, one that's a, quite a sensitive topic. Uh, and generally, much of that work has had been done decades ago by archaeologists because a lot of it hinges on the study of human remains. And of course, now uh, work on human remains indigenous human remains is uh, uh, at uh, done in cooperation and consultation with the Shumash, with, with descendant communities. And so that work is not as uh, abundant today. Still, some of that work is going on in certain contexts. But oftentimes, you know, in the past, it was... Um, Met, you know, there are uh, many early cemeteries that were unfortunately dug up by some of the earliest archaeologists and antiquarians out on the islands. They often targeted cemeteries because you can find human remains and a lot of burial room uh, items that, that were prized. Um, and so that stuff has been studied and looking for things like projectile points in uh, in bone, embedded in bone that, that, that were part of a cause of death or peri fractures, like defensive fractures of arms that show interpersonal violence. Um, also some of, you know, so it's, it's that, but also it's um, uh, new technologies like the bow and arrow, which was uh, probably, um, mostly used as uh, an implement of violence or conflict or I, I hesitate to say warfare. I don't, you know, we're not talking about warfare, uh, but um, I, bow and arrows were probably an important part of interpersonal conflict. So we see those too as, as, as uh, evidence of that. And what was the largest population in the villages? And how did these, how do they maintain such large numbers in a hunter-gatherer society? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, for the islands, I, I, I'll say, I, I probably should have said this in the beginning, but the islands at Spanish uh, arrival, there were at least 3,000 Chumash peoples living on the Northern Channel Islands, which, you know, you think about these islands, that's a lot of people. And I think that's the minimum estimate. Doing paleo demographics is often very, very difficult, right? How do you get at how many people were at a place at any given amount of time, right? How do you calculate that? So we do that in a number of ways, like the number of archeological sites, and we do some analysis on, uh, on what we suspect. We use the, um, the written record as one lens, you know, Spanish records who recorded numbers of peoples, those can certainly be inaccurate. We take that all with a grain of salt. Um, so it villages themselves on the Channel Islands, you know, the larger villages could have a hundred or more people at, at a village. Uh, on the mainland, the, those villages could be even larger, right? We're even larger scattered along uh, the mainland coast. What, Dante, can you tell me the last part of that question? Um, I'm sorry, let me go back to that. I think they wanted to know how did how did they did hunt, a hunter-gatherer society sustain those large numbers? Yeah, that's uh, one of the things that we've, you know, one of the big questions on the islands. And, you know, part of that was diversification, right, in resources. The, these, you know, the kelp forests of, of, uh, that surround the Channel Islands are incredibly productive. And so, and, and shellfish beds. So it was sort of doing a broad scale uh, uh, foraging for a variety of resources, fin fish, sea mammal hunting, shellfish collecting, but also that increase in trade was, was uh, tied to the need for more and more resources. So uh, producing beads out on the islands, those money beads was one way to provision your household or provision villages. You could then go to the mainland and trade beads for things like mast resources, right? Or, or terrestrial game or, or other subsistence resources that are largely unavailable on the islands. Does Catalina Island have the similar history to the Northern Islands? So the, the Southern Islands, Catalina, right, is off of, of uh, LA uh, and it's part of the Southern Channel Island group. There are also four islands in the Southern group. Um, they are very similar. There's a very similar technology. There's a very similar uh, trajectory in terms of this sort of uh, culture history, but it was a different group. It's a Tongva groups, uh, Gabrileño groups on the Southern Islands, the Chumash on the Northern Islands, different languages. We know they were trading and, and interacting with one another, uh, evidence of intermarrying, uh, but slightly different traditions too. The ways you bury dead, um, uh, religious traditions were, were were different. So these were different groups. They were very similar in many ways, but also different. And then the islands themselves are different, right? So the southern islands, for the most part, are farther offshore. They're even drier than the northern islands. So that sets up different trajectories, right? And there, there was a sort of different cultural trajectory as well. We have earlier sites and more abundant earlier sites on the northern islands as compared to the southern islands. But in honesty, there's been more archaeological research done on the northern islands than the southern islands. So some of this, certainly not all of this, but some part of it is an archaeological, um, uh, is a bias in archaeological study, how much we've studied these places. How does one prioritize site stabilization and site testing as sea level rises? Yeah, this is a, this is a huge question. And um, I, I, I'll say this is one that's been ongoing for years. Uh, Channel Islands National Park is, has been and continues to be very concerned about this. I would say the first thing we do is we work with Chumash communities on what to do, right? To some degree, archeological sites are going to be lost because part of the process is that they're gonna erode into the ocean. Now, the rate in which they are eroding into the ocean 
uh, is not natural, right? We have anthropogenic sea level rise, that climate change that's being accelerated by human action. So we are losing archaeological sites at a rapid pace and one that's not natural, right? I mean, we've been losing archaeological sites for millennia, but the rate at which we're losing them now is very concerning. And again, like this history is not just a history of, of California and, and, you know, important to know as part of our, our California and indigenous history here, but it's our roadmap for making the world better uh, and making these places better uh, and fixing the damage we've done. So I'm very concerned about that. There's been a bunch of measures in terms of like netting um, and uh, trying to stabilize sites, uh, but it's a, a, a hugely complicated issue. In my mind, it's working with the Shumash to, to try to figure out strategies. It's doing things like dating sites and sampling sites before they erode completely into the ocean and it's sort of a race against time. Uh, and that's kind of the sobering reality of it. So speaking of today, where do the Chumash live today? Uh, well, there's Chumash communities all over Southern California and Chumash folks all over the world, right? Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, there's a reservation in uh, in the San Ynez Valley, and uh, the, that's the federally recognized group of, of Chumash Indians. There are also several bands along up and down the California coast uh, that are not federally recognized, but are Chumash and continue Chumash tr traditions and are important partners for folks like me who do the archaeology of, of these places. And and do my best to tell the history of their ancestors and, and their people and their traditions. And when you were talking about the Kelp Highway, you showed a couple sites, including Monte Verde. Would mm -hmm. you briefly discuss the significance of the Monte Verde site in Southern Chile? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the people in the New World stuff and, you know, when and how people first got here, you would think, I mean, it, it's just a, it's a great story because I could say, you know, 30 years ago, we knew all the answers. I could tell you exactly when and how people first arrived. And now we don't know the answer. And it seems to be changing every week almost. Maybe not that dramatic, but every year it seems like it, it, it's changing. So this is up here because, you know, Monte Verde is all the way down here. And this is a really important site because in, essentially in the 90s, this was the site that broke what's, what was called the Clovis first hypothesis. This idea that the earliest peoples walked across the Bering Land Bridge during the Ice Age. And as the world warmed around 13,500 years ago, they made it down an ice-free corridor into the heartland of North America and then quickly spread, right? Many of you have probably heard that story in school or read about that story and they're hunting mammoths and mastodons and all this stuff, right? And that was 13,500 years ago when that ice-free corridor opened. Well, when Monte Verde was found and dated and shown by the vast, vast majority of archeologists to be what we think it is, a 14,500 year old site near the coast of Southern South America, it flipped that all on its ear, right? That people were in South America a thousand years before, um, uh, before Clovis. So that opened Pandora's box and, and now we have to figure out when and how people first arrived. So it may be, and I tend to fall into this group that the, the most likely route of the earliest peoples was along the Pacific coast. And we should be looking for evidence of that. But the problem of course is sea levels have risen where if, if you're familiar with, with uh, San Francisco um, during the last glacial maximum when people may have been moving along the coast, you could walk from downtown San Francisco to the Farallon Islands. Right, so we've lost all this coastline and potentially the, these earliest sites in North and South America. So we have to figure out a way to, to better understand this story, which we are. <laughs>
Um, and it now seems that somewhere around 20,000 years ago, people probably first made it to the, to the new world, but that could continue to be pushed back farther and farther. So during the glacial maximum, the islands would have been connected to the mainland? No, they, they actually never were connected to the mainland. They were connected to themselves. So um, they were connected to one another as what we call Santa Rosé, and you could walk across. This, this uh, uh, gap was down to about seven or eight K kilometers. Right, so it was a shorter crossing, but it was never connected to the mainland. So the great thing for a coastal archaeologist like myself is like, I can definitively say you needed a boat to get there. We don't know what that boat looked like. It wasn't a tamal, uh, and we don't know exactly what that boat looked like because boats don't preserve well in the archaeological record, uh, but there was a boat involved. And so then, of course, we just had a question of any idea of what type of watercraft they might have used. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, we have, uh, you know, we can speculate like skin boats, perhaps. Um, uh, also, uh, Thule boats, Thule reed boats that were bundled together and sealed with asphalt on uh, the Shumash were using uh, historically when the, the Spanish arrived, along with tamales. So it's probably some. Um, fiber, you know, some sort of perishable material like that, that people were using boats. And, but they were certainly good enough boats to get out to these islands. And even if I say, you know, it's only 8K, I mean, um, imagine getting into something that's not seaworthy and paddling out against these strong currents where you can run into storms and all sorts of other things. It's a daunting task. And we know that there were lots of people out here very early making lots of boating crossings. So in my mind, they were reliable boats. They weren't just makeshift rafts. Uh, this was intentional crossings that people were making. What that is, I don't know that we'll ever know that. So we have a few different questions regarding the animals on the island. One mm -hmm. is, are there earthworms on all the islands? They, there are, uh, and earthworms do kind of, to some degree, churn up archaeological sites, but, but uh, uh, not as bad. I, I'm not, I think entomologists would do this, but I, you know, I don't know the specifics of that. Yeah. Oh, of and also, what what my, oh, sorry, go ahead. You no, know, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what might have been the purpose of bringing foxes to the island? Controlling mice for the fur or some other reason? Yes and yes. Right. So I think, you know, I, we can only speculate. Right. I mean, it used to be that a biologist thought that they kind of naturally got to the islands, naturally rafted out to the islands. And that doesn't mean they made a raft and paddled out there. Obviously, it means like during storms, they got caught on vegetation rafts and were swept out to the islands. That happens in islands right but now we know or we are um and even the biologists are on board that this was an intentional introduction and so why that happened uh you know there's a lot of speculation in that i would say uh one of the things that that, that makes sense to me is that if you've been out on the islands and especially been to san miguel when the wind is blowing even during nice times a year, it's very maritime. It could get very cold and having a nice uh, fur fox pelt coat would be pretty nice. So I think there's fur and sort of that technology is important. I do think that to some degree, the control of things like mice might've been important as well. Um, uh, they weren't domesticated, right? These foxes were, were not domesticated. So they weren't pets, um, but also those might've been, foxes might've been brought out there because as you can imagine, if you need, they could have acted as this uh, source of protein in times where it was needed. So if you needed a, a source of protein uh, without other terrestrial animals, a fox would be a good option to hunt. Right, they also were using their bones as tools and we find their bones in middens. So we, we suspect that they were doing, they were eating foxes to some degree, but we don't find a lot of fox bones in archeological sites. 
Uh, if they were using them for pelts, they could skin them and just throw the, the remains away and only the pelt being brought back, that wouldn't leave an archeological signature. So there's a lot of speculation, but I think it makes a lot of sense as sort of a provision for times where you need food um, and for a technological reason. Is there any early artwork from the people on the island? There are, there's not a lot. There's a, a really rich tradition of uh, rock art on the California mainland. There's less so on the islands. Uh, we do have sites um, that have petroglyphs and, and cave art um, basically chiseled in, in, into stone uh, in several sites on the islands. Um, but there's no dramatic like uh, 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 rock art that we see on the mainland, like painted caves and, and, and other things, right? So, um, uh, so th that seems to be one of the differences between the mainland and the islands. But to some degree, a lot of the interior of especially places like Santa Rosa, that's very large and rugged in the interior and Santa Cruz have been largely unexplored by archeologists. So there's caves everywhere. And uh, archaeologists have only been in a fraction of those. So I do think there is something to this difference between islands and mainland in terms of, of cave art. Um, but I, in coming years, I wouldn't be surprised if, if more was found. Were adornment and currency the only values associated with shell for trade? Um, you know, uh, well, when we say adornment, I mean, there are like beautifully made uh, pendants and things that were, were a part of the trade economy. They're uh, among these like uh, necklaces of uh, shell money beads that are just are bleached white. So you'd think that, that, you know, they're, they're all white. There would be like red abalone shells kind of put into those and mussel shells to give it purple and red colors and then black abalone shells to, you know, to, to do pops of color in it. So, um, and then there were other items that, that, that were being made like uh, bone whistles and uh, hairpins and um, uh, uh, like beads, like specialized beads that were made out of things like uh, rock scallop shells and just the really hard end of them that often have these like brilliant purple and pink coloration to them. So when you start looking at the material culture, the artifacts and the, and, and the materials that were being produced by the Shumash, especially late in time, it's dazzling. The, the kinds of artifacts, the beauty of these things, incised bone artifacts, um, uh, 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 drums or um, uh, whistles and uh, I, don't know, I, I, I don't know why I'm missing the name, but um, kind of shakers that, to, to, to make sounds and things like it, it, it and headdresses and things. There's a very famous, um, swordfish headdress that that um, um, that was found in an archaeological site. So, and, and then paint dishes. I could go on and on made from swordfish bones and whale vertebrae that were carved out into to bowls. Um, so there, there's this dizzying variety, especially after 1500 years ago, of material culture that was traded uh, all over the islands and mainland. All right, and then we have a couple questions about underwater archaeology off of yeah. the Channel Islands. So what does that look like? Is it worth the time and money to look for sites that have been submerged? And yeah. what type of technology is needed in order to um, in order to find these sites? Yeah, so we, we just got done um, a couple years ago with a five-year um, project to um, better understand the paleo landscape along the Northern Channel Islands. And uh, this was funded by, it, it was a huge grant, it, uh, and it was funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, if you've ever heard of them. But one of the things that they're tasked with is um, 
approving offshore development. So things like if there's going to be wind turbines offshore, they're going to lay cable um, across the seafloor. And one of the really cool things in my mind was that BOEM, this federal agency, recognized that because of this history on the Northern Channel Islands and the California and, and larger New World Coast, that there were very likely sites that have been inundated by post-glacial sea level rise. And so we can't potentially damage those with offshore development and laying of cable and all this stuff that could happen. We have to protect those. And so the first thing we need to do is better understand these paleo landscapes. So we entered into this project where it was our task to sort of uh, do geophysical imaging, sonar imaging from a boat to map the seafloor, and this has been done by geologists, but to add to some of this high resolution mapping that maps the seafloor, and then is technology that can map the subsea floor and do things like under, see if we could predict what these offshore environments look like when they were onshore, right? And uh, if we can identify places that were are most likely to contain archaeological sites, not only that are preserved against wave action and all the stuff that happens to our seafloor once it is on the seafloor, um, but places that would have been magnets for people uh, living on Santa Rosa or Lantana. And so we did a bunch of mapping and predicting and and and. Um, and then coring the seafloor to see if these paleo landscapes were there. And we indeed were, were able to develop models that we could uh, predict these paleo landscapes. So while we didn't find an archeological site underwater along the Channel Islands, what we did do, and what I think this is, is a really impor important first step for understanding what these paleo landscapes look like. So in the future, we can do more work to try to identify sites, to find those sites. So it's kind of the first step. I mean, I kind of tell everyone, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the, uh, the, the floor of our oceans. So uh, it's doing that initial work is really important. Uh, Amy Gusick, who is at uh, the LA County Natural History Museum, she was on our team for all this. She was uh, a PI on all this. And um, she's now kind of the person that's leading efforts to continue work to look for sites underwater. And she's working with uh, a variety of geophysicists and marine geologists to develop new technologies that seem to be uh, that they may, uh, it looks like they can do things like identify, not only map the seafloor, but identify when concentrations of shells that would make up an archaeological site are found. And so maybe these emerging technologies are really exciting because they may actually help us really pinpoint where archaeological sites might be if we can go do the work in the, in the appropriate areas. Well, thank you so much, Todd. We look forward to your future research. And thank you to everyone for attending tonight's Living Room Lecture. For more information on our upcoming events, please visit our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Thank you and have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.